Well, I'd like to start this talk with a look at the big picture. Uh, grateful to Google for this image, for the Getty. Um, I want to look at the wider city that surrounds the Bankside and London Bridge area. Um, after all, it's from this context that so many of the people come uh, to visit Bankside and London Bridge. And I'd like us all to consider the shape of this area, the shape of the city. It has a, a circular geometry focused on the elephant and castle with radials that have already been referred to today. Uh, Waterloo Road, Southwark Bridge Road, Borough High Street. It's also got the rim of the Thames. And I'd like to suggest that this geometry is not just incidental, but it's actually quite powerful. And it's more than merely a shape. It's a configuration of space. It's a network, as Mark Brearley referred to this morning. It's a very intricate network as well. And the, what it does is it manages the movement of people on foot, on bikes, and in vehicles throughout the area. And in that regard, it's an element of design. And it has a past, a present, and it's clearly got a future. And so the main point I want to make in this presentation is that we need to give as much attention to the design of this network as we do to that of any individual building. And I don't simply mean we need to design the transport network, because again, cities are about more than transport, uh, more than just movement. The spatial network is it's the principal engine of social and economic transaction in London. It's the most important vessel of human interaction. It's where we meet, it's where we greet, it's where we buy, it's where we sell. And not only this, the spatial network that we can see from the air here is also, I think, London's most evolved historic object. Now, some of its parts are largely unchanged since their Roman origins. Others, such as Southwark Street, as we heard, and the Thames Path, are more recent. And the wheel shape of south central London, with its, with its centre, its radials, and its, its rim, look at first sight anyway like a classic case of urban growth. Uh, starting at the middle, heading outwards. But of course, as again was referred to before, we've got to remember this is special here. It's happened the other way around. Uh, the growth began at the edge on the river, began at the rim, and then it moved in on the spokes towards the eventual hub at the elephant. And if I may, Chairman, by the way, the area is actually sprinkled with conservation areas. Um, Bankside and Bear Garden, Bermondsey Street, Borough High Street, just to mention a few. Borough High Street, I noticed, um, designated in 1968, uh, nearly as old as me. Um, and I think uh, the, the, this, this, this shape, this growth, is often underplayed in municipal planning. Um, the fact we draw borough boundaries down the river, the, the fact we draw the central activity zone differently in the north and the south, doesn't help the appreciation of the importance of the river. And especially for a borough like Southwark, um, as Nick Stanton ad admitted, I, th I thought very fairly earlier, it's always tempting in a long and thin borough to think geometrically about its middle, you know, sort of Peckham, in which case Bankside and uh, London Bridge is, it's not just the edge, it's the distant edge of the borough. And I think the Bankside and London Bridge pan plan, which we've seen illustrated outside and referred to today, will help greatly to address uh, this sense of place for the area. It's not just at the edge. It, it is a place in its own right, and it's at the heart of something very special. And in reflecting on that plan, I, I want to keep my comments just on one subject, it's tempting to go broadly with the conversation today. But I'd just like to talk about the Thames, because the Riverside Walk, and we've seen this image, a much clearer version of it, earlier today. Uh, it comes up again and again in the plan. 
are drawn as a broad sweeping arrow that recognizes the importance of the Riverside Walk, its high pedestrian flows, its social, its cultural, and its economic prowess. And like the rim of a wheel, it's the part of the borough that most often touches the world beyond. And it's tempting, I think, to consider that it's, it's all right, isn't it? Does it need much attention? Um, it, after all, it's got all of Nick Stanton's emblematic buildings on it and, and more that we've just seen coming. It's looking after itself, is it? Well, I'd like to suggest perhaps not. And let's look a little more closely at the Thames path. Because in places, it isn't on the Thames, it's actually here, as in Clink Street, diving inland. It's far from being the broad diagrammatic arrow in the plan. Instead, it's narrow in parts. It's pinching the movement of pedestrians. It creates congestion and frustration. Now, try walking it. I'm sure many of us here have on, on any really fine lunchtime, um, any, pretty much any time of the year. It's a victim of its success. And furthermore, consider this. However bad the conditions are today for pedestrians and joggers jostling to do what they want to do, which is enjoy it, we need to consider how they're going to be when the various major new developments that we've seen presented today come on stream. And nor is the route of the Thames path effortlessly sweeping, as it's tempting to read into in, in the draft plan that I've seen. In reality, the route of the path twists and turns, forcing people away from the water's edge when it comes to passing beneath, for example, the bridges, Blackfriars, Southwark and Tower Bridge, London Bridge. Um, this diagram here represents the, the twists and the turns. Now, you may say these are, there's a sort of romantic notion of labyrinthine quality to the Thames path, that it, this should all be enjoyable. Perhaps it is when it's fairly quiet and you can enjoy this, but it, it really creates problems when you're walking along and all of a sudden out of almost nowhere, a cyclist appears or another pedestrian appears and that twist and turn is actually something working against the conviviality of the Thames. Again, the level changes east of London Bridge are perilous. The steep steps set at an angle to the movement uh, don't help the continuity. And Simon Hudspeth, who I spoke to in the break, had a scheme to try and repair this by going uh, waterside underneath London Bridge. It's that kind of thinking that I'd like to argue might help address the pressure increasingly uh, coming to bear on the London path. So if we're going to create a realistic plan for Bankside and London Bridge, I think we need to address this detail as well as the diagram. Um, for my part as a, as a practitioner, an architect and planner, uh, my practice has been, been involved in many projects in, in the Bankside area, um, contributing to the public space network we find today from the South Bank in the west to more London, Pottersfield in the east, Coin Street in between, and various other places, the Tate, the Millennium Footbridge, um, and the Cannon Street Footbridge. Anybody remember that one? Proposal to strap a pedestrian footbridge to the side of the railway bridge at Cannon Street. Why, from what I've seen, is there no mention of this in the draft plan? It was a consented project, gone through detailed consultation. It would help over four million people a year cross the, cross the river between Southwark and the city, relieving pressure on the transport system, relieving pressure on the roads. Now, over the last 20 years, we've seen movement levels increase dramatically in the area uh, doing this work, no more so than the Thames Path. And if there's one thing that you can seem to count on, it's that any improvement to the Thames path will be rewarded with pedestrian activity. This is good money for good, good, good outcomes. People come to the river to be on the water, to walk beside it, to enjoy the long and broad perspectives that really, I think, only arrived in London's parks, except on the river, you haven't got the trees in the way. You can see the buildings in the distance, for those of us with an architectural mind in particular. Um, and these improvements have three characteristics, in my experience, uh, that are worth considering and building into any future changes. First, they add capacity to the Thames path by making it wider, uh, wider for walking, jogging, and cycling. This, like we can see here, the improvements in front of the Royal Festival Hall at the South Bank Centre. 
um, they make room for everybody. There's no need for a you know, jog here, cycle there, walk there. If it's wide enough, people will find the balance. Um, so they add capacity. Second thing they do is they add conviviality by creating places and events, facilities along the path, such as the cafes here at the Royal Festival Hall, the restaurants at Park Street, the kiosks at Pottersfield Park. Uh, they spice the route. And third, they add continuity. They take out the twists and turns that otherwise interrupt the flow. And I think the first two, the capacity argument and the conviviality argument, are fairly uncontentious. And the third, this continuity one, I think needs more of an explanation. You know, why, after all, should it be so important to keep the route straight, uh, straight enough so that it unfolds simply? Because there are consequences to doing so. And to address this, let's just look at one instance at Southwark Bridge. This is the view as you approach Southwark Bridge from the west. And not recently, I watched a party of school children uh, from my vantage point up on the bridge. Looking, they started their journey. I picked them up pretty much where this photograph's taken here, walking eastwards towards Southwark Bridge. And um, there came a point where they, they sort of paused, and a few of the braver ones up front had a look into the tunnel under the bridge, which is the route of the Thames Path that takes you through there. And then they came back again. And they went around uh, the other side and couldn't see over the water. And then they went up the stairs onto Southwark Bridge and over the other side, encountering on the way the traffic, the coaches parked up, and the, uh, the vehicles of the bridge itself. And that seemed very strange and rather dangerous to me. And they, of course, they're not the only ones. Hundreds of thousands of people every year are doing the same thing. For the sake of a little continuity, quite a lot of risk is currently happening on the Thames. Um, there are pinch points, as in this diagram here in red, where there isn't the capacity for the sorts of standards that Transport for London expect elsewhere in improvements that are made to London's transport infrastructure. And I'd like us to consider the path as part of that transport infrastructure it should work to the same standards. And this convoluted journey, this risk, um, adds delay to people, and it frustrates them. And this was a lesson we learned working at Trafalgar Square. When 10 years ago, 99% of all Londoners walking through Trafalgar Square walked the long way around the outside, rather than the short route through the middle. And they did so because it was simpler and quicker. Because the only way to do it previously was through the dog leg stairs. And what the central staircase, the new central staircase at Trafalgar Square did, was to make it much easier to take the simple route. And as a result of that, levels of movement in Trafalgar Square have increased superbly, as has the appreciation of the place. But not before critical concerns were overcome about the heritage, the important heritage of that grade one listed environment. And in the end, the greater good prevailed, supported by evidence, supported by a vision of a proposition that the demolition was allowed. And I raise the discussion of the greater good because I suspect its consideration will inform the negotiation of many of the ideas we hear about in the Bankside and London Bridge plan, as well as in the discussions today. And the area is layered in history. It's, it's flavored by its different local communities, the different identities of them. And it's bedded in environmental riches, not least the tidal uh, foreshore of the River Thames. All of these things must be considered, and the greater good weighed against that consideration. But Bankside and London Bridge is also burdened by the pressure of human interest, by the, att the attention of private and public sector development agencies, by the presence of people on the ground. And in events like this, the uh, events on the river, um, my fear, and I use the word carefully, is that something's going to go wrong unless something's done about the water's edge. Um, Bankside urban forest is important and welcome, so too ideas like this to develop the radials, but I think it's unrealistic to imagine that only by uh, treating these radial connections or the routes behind, the laterals behind the river, 
that the overall picture is going to be improved because if those improvements go in, people will use them and come to the river and increase the burden. Um, Michael Davis, who's sitting in the audience today, is a local Bermondsey resident who came up with this concept. It's been developed by Connie Bear Morrison Architects in Sydney for the London Promenade, which proposes to straighten up and broaden the Thames Path in those places where it does pinch, where it is narrow, where it does twist. And I think it's a great opportunity to create a new movement culture for the Thames with the sorts of capacity for many different sorts of users. For our part, we've looked at it and we've found that another 30 million people would be likely to use this route if it were broadened and straightened. And I can't think of any other infrastructure project that creates such a level of improvement without taking space from any uh, vehicle in the capital. And so this project is uh, progressing through quiet consultation in the local community today. And we wanted to bring it to, to you today. I know there are faces in the audience here that have seen it before and we've had the opportunity to speak with. And we've, we're looking at how its improvements in this diagram here ripple back into the heartland of the area and create uh, the beneficial impact which we hope it would bring. It brings five new river piers to the Thames, which would make it possible to run a river bus operationally effectively, not just our opinion, this is the opinion of the river bus operators who are crying out for more piers. And it seems to fit rather handsomely with London's policy to enhance the river. Uh, we've had a lot of trouble getting to speak to either of the mayors. Getting through the front door has been a, a big difficulty. Uh, we hope that'll change uh, because we think, as with cities elsewhere in the world that are improving their waterfronts, whether it's Sydney or Singapore, uh, London has the opportunity to do the same thing. Thank you very much.